Hey, I'm back. Good to be back. Good to be back. Uh, so I'm just going to be totally transparent with you. I was not going to do a quick reaction to the Elite Eight game, UConn versus Illinois. Uh, I got to do radio at 11 p.m. Eastern time. I certainly wasn't going to do it with the way the game started early. UConn uh, and Illinois tied at 23. It's 28 to 23 going into the, the to halftime. But then we saw a second half that quite literally is unlike anything that we have ever seen in an Elite Eight game. As to end the first half and start the second half, UConn went on a 30 nothing run to cruise to a victory. The game actually isn't even over yet. I, I had to rush out this quick reaction before I go do radio. But UConn, they are headed to their second straight Final Four. They are obviously the overwhelming favorites, and they showed just how good they can be on a stage like the Elite Eight. And by the way, I'm just here to say this. I don't think it goes without saying. I don't think anybody's surprised. But this, this program right now is the class of college basketball, the Envy. Um, and what we saw Saturday, independent of what happens next week in Phoenix, was incredible. Funny thing about it was, first half of the game wasn't one we're going to be telling our grandkids about, okay? Uh, as I said, it was tied at 23, about two minutes left in the first half. UConn goes on a 5-0 run. They're up five. And I'll say this, like, like first I heard all the, this is the worst game I've ever seen. This is why college basketball stinks. It's like, stop, okay? We get bad halves and bad moments and bad games and standalone spots all the time. A few years ago, Patriots played the Rams in the Super Bowl. I think it was 2016. It was three nothing at halftime. So we get bad games and bad halves all the time. But I bring it up because I actually looked at it as the opposite. And maybe it's my UConn tinted glasses. I don't know. For people who don't know, I'm a UConn alum. But I bring it up because I actually looked at it from the exact opposite perspective. I said, I actually thought it was the best case scenario for UConn. Because think about UConn. They're up 28-23 at the half. They're playing the defending, the, 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 the Big Ten champions, with a legitimate first round pick in Terrence Shannon Jr. And they're up by five in a game where, how about this? In the first half, they were one for 12 from three. I believe the stat was starters not named Donovan Klingon were one of 18. And basically, let's just boil it down like this. I think you could legitimately argue that UConn's first half was the worst half of the season for Tristan Newton, who is an All-American, who has been basically UConn's Best player the entire season. This is a guy, Tristan Newton, who on the year is averaging uh, is averaging 15.7 boards, six assists per game. He had four at the half. Cam Spencer had four at the half. He's averaging 15 points on 44% three-point shooting. Alex Caravan, future NBA player, averaging 14 points per game, had zero. Steph Castle, All Amer or McDonald's All-American future lottery pick, had zero. And so when you looked at the first half, everyone's talking about all the negatives. I sat there and said, wait a second now. Your two best players have a combined eight points in what was each of their worst halves of the season. But then two, on top of that, you got zero combined points from two future NBA players, including a lottery pick, and you're up by five. I will take it. And that is exactly what we got. <laughs> that is exactly what ended up happening. Because when that second half started, let me say this. I don't know when I realized, oh my goodness, this is an avalanche. But UConn tends to do this. Remember, the other night against San Diego State, it was close in the first half. Remember, the San Diego State game, they were only up by nine in the first half. They end up outscoring them by 21 in the second half, and that's deceptive because San Diego State scored a few points late to make it close. The same thing happened in the Big East tournament. Marquette. They ended up, they were up by what? Two at the half. They end up winning by 16. This is who they are. And this is who that program has been all year. And so you look at the second half, you look at the run. We have never seen anything like this. And I got to give credit to two people and two people specifically, one kind of in the micro and one in the macro. The micro, Donovan Klingon. Listen, this guy, you know, and, and Brad Underwood's going to get some criticism because I don't think the game plan was very good. I don't think it was terrible when Donovan Klingon picked up the first foul, you know, whatever it was, a, a minute or two into the game. And then when he came back in, Brad Underwood kept telling his guys, driving him, driving him, driving him, driving him. But I bring it up because by, you know, the middle of the, 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 middle of the first half, 
I think by easily the middle of the first half, it was like, you have to stop driving at this guy. He is embarrassing you. Okay. As I record here, there's about two minutes left in the game. My assumption is that Donovan Klingon is out for the game and he finishes this game with, how about this? 22 points, 10 rebounds. The stat sheet says there were only four blocks. I'll be blunt. I don't believe that. I might have to go back and watch the game this week because that I, I remember at least six or seven, it feels like, and a bunch of others where he absolutely changed um, the trajectory, you know, changed the shots, changed the offense, changed this, changed that. So I didn't think it was a great game plan by Brad Underwood, but I don't think there's any way you can really game plan for an NBA center, seven foot two, long arms, pretty mobile for a guy his size who completely dominates the paint. And this is what we have talked about from the UConn perspective, probably for about the last six or eight weeks. You know, they were a top 10 offense all year long, but the crazy part was they were like a top two defense when Donovan Klingon, you know, the stats say they're a top 12, top 15 defense, whatever. They are were a top like one to two defense in college basketball with Donovan Klingon on the floor. By the way, I said top 10 offense. By the time the Illinois game started, they were the number one offense in college basketball. UConn fans don't yell at me, okay? But I bring it up because Klingon was the difference. Klingon was the X factor. Klingon carried them early. And then as the game went on, Illinois kept trying to go at him, kept trying to go at him, kept trying to go at him. And it was the blocks, the rebounds, the fast breaks that led to that 30 to nothing run late in the first half, early in the second. The other guy that, listen, what this game was about to me, I've said it for weeks, and I think there is no denying it at this point. Dan Hurley is the best coach in college basketball, bar none right now this second. There are other guys that are good. Nate Oates is good. Tom Izzo is a Hall of Famer. John Calipari is a Hall of Famer. But if you're talking about right now, this second, a guy you would want to start your program, to run your program, and to take it going forward, Dan Hurley's the guy. He's one of the few guys that in this era has been able to build a culture to keep guys in the program. Now, he's lost transfers, and he's brought transfers in. But I think he checks every single box. One, he's still hard on his guys, but they respect him and respond to it. We know in this era, that's as hard as anything. Two, I've said it a million times. He is the best evaluator, in my opinion, in college basketball. You go through all of the guys that he has had in this program through the years. Um, you know, and, and we talk about guys, I'm talking about guys that, that, that have been drafted. Just think about this from Dan Hurley's perspective, okay? Um, think about all of the guys that he had and all of the guys, how they were recruited, how they were developed, all that good stuff, okay? How about this? James Book Knight was a lottery pick, 66th in his recruiting class. Tyrese Martin, second round NBA draft pick, came with him from Rhode Island. 226th in his class. Jordan Hawkins, lottery pick last year, 51st in his class. Donovan Klingon, 56th ranked player in his recruiting class. Alex Caravan, a fringe top 100 player. This guy gets guys in. He develops them. He creates a culture. And then what I also think he does better than anybody is identifying fits in the transfer portal and identifying guys that frankly are willing to play a role. Cam Spencer, coming in to play the role of Jordan Hawkins. Uh, Hassan Diara being willing to come off the bench as a guy that began his career at Texas A&M. He could be starting for 300 whatever uh, Division I college basketball programs right now. He came off the bench, sixth man of the year, and he is going to a second straight Final Four. Credit to him. You have uh, whatever. Uh, you, you know, Samson Johnson could have transferred, didn't play much last year. He's back this year. He played a huge role. You could argue in the first half, Samson Johnson and Hassan Diara were the two of the three best players for UConn. And so you go on and on down the list. He brings guys in. He develops them. He created a culture. And the cool thing was, and I asked him about this at the, the Final Four last year, he did it in an era before the transfer portal. He did it in an era where they had to take their lumps early, where you couldn't just bring in nine new guys. And I'm not blaming any program that does that because if he took over right now, they would probably do the same. But it is incredible. They are the envy of every program in college basketball, as they should be, going to a second straight Final Four, and they are just operating at the highest level. A 25-point win in the Elite Eight over the Big Ten champion. 
So credit to the UConn Huskies, the, 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 the envy of every program in college basketball. And let me wrap by saying this. UConn still has two games to go back to back, and I'm not putting the cart before the horse, okay? But what I will say is this, is that I think if Dan Hurley does it, we have to talk about that as amongst the greatest accomplishments in college basketball history. And let me tell you why, okay? It is because the last time it happened, everyone keeps saying, well, you know, the last time it happened uh, was, uh, you, you know, it was uh, it was uh, Florida in 2006 and 2007. Well, that's true. But remember, Florida brought back all five starters from the, the first national championship team. Duke in 1992 brought back four of its top five starters from its national championship team. UCLA, you could guess, they brought back a lot of guys a lot of years. UConn is doing it without their top three players from last year. Jordan Hawkins, lottery pick. Andre Jackson, second round pick. Adama Sanogo, undrafted, playing for the Chicago Bulls. It is incredible. Credit to Dan Hurley. Credit to UConn, which is now headed to its second straight Final Four. And oh, by the way, it's uh, two games away from the first back-to-back -back national championship in close to 20 years. If you enjoyed this quick reaction, make sure to subscribe to the Aaron Torres Pod YouTube. New videos, new everything all week. We're just wall-to-wall -wall with college hoops. We'll have a full reaction episode on Sunday night. Make sure you're subscribed. Turn on the notifications. We really do appreciate your support.